My name is Mark, a recording angel. I've been observing this earth since the dawn of creation. The Most High has asked me to share my recordings with you. The following are my records of Old Testament prophets and kings, and scheming scoundrels too, collected in this book, Exile of the Chosen, God's Heroes from Solomon to Malachi. If today's recording contains situations which might be uncomfortable for younger listeners, I will mark the video with the words parental guidance recommended. Chapter 12, Part 1, Aisha. As Aisha heard the summoning bell, she and her friend, Saroya, scrambled to their feet and hurried to answer. They bowed low before Hegei, the chamberlain in charge of the court of women. As you know, he began, a new batch of virgins will arrive this afternoon, and you will begin instructing the new slave girls who will be their servants. I hope that you have divided the slaves up so that at least one experienced slave is in charge of each group. In time, they will learn what they need to know, but some instructors are better than others. You are my best. The servant girls smiled. Words of praise were few and far between for slaves, even though Hegei was a kinder chamberlain than many. I'm giving you each three new slaves to start with, and those of you who end up with a girl that looks like she has potential to be a royal wife will receive additional servants. After you receive your assigned servants, I'd like you to take them to the chambers and prepare the rooms for their new occupants. The first of the new virgins should be here this afternoon. That will be all. Aisha nudged Saroya. Hear that? We're the best. Saroya laughed. We are slaves at the very bottom of the pecking order in this palace, but at least we're the best of the bottom, huh? We won't be at the bottom anymore, Aisha laughed. There'll be at least three people beneath us. Did you ever think that would happen? Even though their backgrounds were very different, they had much in common, and once they had learned enough new language to communicate with each other, they had become close friends. Both of them had been brought to the palace of Shushan as spoils of war. Saroya had come from the campaigns to the east in India. Aisha had been captured in the west. And while both girls were terribly homesick, and adjusting to life as a slave was difficult, they had formed a close friendship and found many things in common. Aisha had received her three slave girls and had prepared the chamber. Incense burned in the corner to make the room smell good, and beautiful gauze hangings covered the window. She wondered what her new mistress would be like. Now remember... She said to the three newer slave girls, We must make each wife as happy and as beautiful as possible. All of the girls coming in this afternoon will probably be just as frightened as we were when we arrived here. Their whole future depends on one night with the king, and if he's having a bad day, they may spend the rest of their lives in the harem, never seeing their families again, but not being able to have one here either. It is in our best interest to make sure her night pleases the king, and to do that, we need to make her happy. Do you understand? The slave girls nodded. If he does like her and he summons her again, our lives will be better too. And should he actually choose her for his queen, we'll be some of the better off slaves in all of Persia. The girls smiled bashfully. Can you do that? They nodded eagerly. Then we may as well relax until Hegei summons us. It seemed they had just sat down when they heard the bell. They hurried into his chambers and lined up, eyes on the floor until he addressed them. Several other girls stood with him, all of them looking uncomfortable. Some appeared anxious and afraid. Others had tightly clenched jaws. Naisha, Hegei said, this one is yours. He turned to the young woman. Tell her your name. Uh, uh, uh Esther, she stumbled nervously. Hegei laughed. Don't get too forgetful. One has to at least remember one's name around here. If you want the king to remember it, you must remember it yourself. Esther's face remained blank as the other girls laughed. Great, Aisha thought. I'm getting one without the sense of humor. She looked at her new mistress a little more closely and noticed the red puffy eyes. The girl was obviously beautiful, but she had been crying. Aisha shrugged. She couldn't blame her for that. Esther... Hegai continued, this is Aisha, 
She will be your main servant, and these three slaves will assist her. If you have any wants or needs, tell Aisha, and one of the girls will take care of it for you. I will be by later to make sure everything is all right. Come with me, my lady, Aisha said, bowing to her. We have a chamber prepared for you. As Aisha led her down the hall, the other three slave girls trailed behind. When they entered the chamber, Esther drew a sharp breath. It's so tiny, she whispered. Aisha nodded. Yes, the rooms in the harem are small, but at least you will have some privacy, something few of us had in our original homes, even those of us who were taken from wealthier families. Her eyes met Esther's. Suddenly a flash of understanding took place between them. You were brought here too? Esther asked. Most of us were war captives. Gifts to the king? Aisha said, nodding toward the other three. She hoped the admission would make the new wife feel more comfortable. The king had sent out a call for beautiful virgins to be brought to the palace after he had exiled Queen Vashti for her disobedience. All of them had been very young, and most of them seemed frightened when they arrived, although some tried to appear proud and hopeful. Aisha guessed that their families were much more proud and hopeful than any of the girls themselves. "'Your parents must be very proud that you are here in the palace and might someday be queen,' she said politely. "'I have no parents,' Esther replied slowly. "'Just a cousin.' more like an uncle, really. He has taken care of me as long as I can remember. Aisha did not know what to say. He works here at the palace as an official at the gate, Esther continued. Suddenly it all made sense to Aisha. This way the cousin would no longer have to support a daughter that wasn't even his, and should she receive favor from the king, he could stand to receive great benefit. Has anyone told you what to expect yet? Esther shook her head. Sit down. She motioned for the other slave girls to do the same. Here's what we have planned for you during the next year. All of the virgins who come into the palace spend twelve months in purification before they ever see the king. The new wife lowered her eyes. Couldn't I just come back in a year when it was my turn to see the king? Aisha laughed. Ah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But you'll be receiving a special diet from the king's kitchens. They want you to be strong and healthy, but if there's anything you would really like to eat that they don't offer you, let me know. I'll try and get it for you. For the first six months, your beauty treatments will consist of special skin oils because the air is so dry here. You'll be receiving two oil massages every day, plus the usual bathing and soaking. By the time we're done with you, your skin will be as soft and beautiful as a baby's. The second six months, we'll be doing lots of perfuming. Also, we burn spices on that incense over here so that they will soak into your hair and your skin and your body until you always smell fragrant. Esther said nothing. This chamber is yours. We also have common areas where all the women can go. There are no men in the house except for the eunuchs, so you're never in any danger of being seen by men. The harem has its own private gardens and bathing areas. Do you have any questions? Slowly Esther shook her head. Aisha took both of Esther's hands in hers. Don't be so sad. It really will be okay once you get used to it. Esther raised her red-rimmed eyes and looked into Aisha's. Smiling gently back, Aisha said, Everyone here understands. Although she nodded faintly, Esther still said nothing. Turning to the other three servants, Aisha directed them to prepare Esther a bath. Then we will get her into some more appropriate clothing and help her settle in. After your bath, we will look at some fabrics and decide which colors are the most becoming for your skin tones. Aisha drew a deep breath. Let's get going. The others hurried out of the room. I smiled as once again I realized that the Almighty had handpicked the perfect companion for Esther. My charge would be a great comfort to her as she adjusted to harem life. My lady, Esther, Aisha repeated. The young woman jumped. Oh, yes, I, um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It's a new name for you, isn't it? The servant girl said quietly. The young woman's eyes grew round. Please don't tell anybody. My lips are sealed. And my loyalty is yours, my lady. I would never reveal any of your secrets. Besides, Aisha is not the name I was born with either, but sometimes it's best to fit in where we find ourselves. Esther smiled shyly. My friend Saroya, though, Aisha continued, she's the head maid for another of the harem virgins. She kept her name, Saroya. It's a different name, but it has a nice ring to it, and no one would ever forget it or confuse her for someone else. That could be either a good thing or a bad thing. 
Aisha laughed. Ha, huh, yes, especially around here. Where is Soroya from? Esther asked. She comes from a land far to the east, one of the king's most distant provinces. It's where we import many of the spices and silks from. I believe that her family was quite wealthy and she had a good life before becoming a slave. Do you think she would tell me about her country? Of course, she would probably love to have someone willing to listen to her talk about her country and family, what life was like for her as a little girl, the things she saw, and her gods. It's all quite different. Perhaps if you were to invite her mistress to your quarters for an afternoon, we could all visit together. That would be wonderful. I'm always interested in other peoples, and the way they do things, and see things, and worship. Ah, well, you've come to the perfect place, Aisha sighed. Because there are women here from everywhere in the world, and most of them are lonesome for home and would enjoy talking about it. And I, for one, would be delighted to listen to something besides the usual palace gossip. Sometimes I think the fact that we don't have enough to do makes such malicious gossip more attractive to us. I would much rather hear about other countries and other people, too. Good, let's do that. For now, tell me about your home. Ah, I've had several. I'm from Egypt, at least that's where my family lived when I was very little. But because my father was a merchant, we traveled to other places. I did not come here until I was twelve years old. Tell me some of the stories that you heard when you were a little girl. Ah, Aisha said. My father was quite a storyteller. Good, I will wallow in as many of these beauty baths as you want, if you'll tell me stories. It's a deal. My dad told me this story once. Aisha, how is your mistress doing? Is she adjusting well? Hege, I asked. Yes, the servant girl said. She seemed very quiet and sad at first, but she's doing better, and I'm finding out what her interests are, and that helps. She appears to be one of our virgins with great potential. I could see her greatly pleasing the king. Because of that, I would like to give her more servants and move her to larger quarters. I think it will be worth everything we invest in her. He was thoughtful for a moment. So, what are her interests? He continued. Is it something we can help her with? Give her more of? Does she have a favorite fragrance or fabric? Aisha laughed. <laughs> she always dresses attractively, but she doesn't have much interest in those things. Instead, she's intrigued by different peoples and cultures, and she's always asking to hear stories about the other women's homelands. Does she have a particular country she's most interested in? I don't believe so. I think she's just fascinated by people. Hagee, I appeared to consider this. I have a suggestion, Aisha continued. If you wish to give her more slaves, selecting them from a variety of faraway places would probably delight her more than anything else you could do, especially if you found some who enjoy storytelling. Well, that could be done, he decided. That is probably the easiest request I've had all week. Does she ever speak of her family? Never, but she's fascinated by the families of everyone else. Hmm, that's very interesting. It's unusual for a Persian to care that much about conquered peoples. Hege, I seem to come to a decision. Well, I'll be sending you some more slave girls this afternoon. You may interview them and select the ones you think would be most interesting to your mistress. And let me know if there's anything else I can do for her. I will, Aisha said. I have to watch and see what it is that she wants, and she asks for so little. Hegei rolled his eyes and laughed. Ha, 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 and that is really unusual in here. Aisha selected three new slaves for her mistress, one from the cooler lands of the north, one with dark Kushite skin from the south, and a Judahite from the conquered lands to the west. She chose them not only for their distant countries, but also their willingness to talk. The new servants delighted Esther. She seemed bored with many of the beauty routines, but enjoyed hours of stories, whether they involved the girls' families or histories, cultural practices, or the gods they worshipped. It was good for the girls, too, to be able to speak of their homelands to someone who actually wanted to listen. One day, Brana had been describing her family and their life in the Northlands. Most of the storytelling had been happy occasions, but today Brana was homesick and burst into tears mid-story. Rizpa, the young Judahite, put her arms around her. I know just how you feel, she said, tearing up too. How can you? Anexi snapped. What do you mean? Rizpa asked. I know why I'm here, 
and I know why Brana's here. Most of us belong to conquered peoples. What I don't understand is why Rispa is here. Didn't the previous king give a decree that all of your people should go back to your country and rebuild your temple? If you're far away from home, it's your own fault. Rispa caught her breath sharply as her eyes filled with tears. At the same moment, Esther jumped to her feet and stood with her back to the slaves, gazing out the window for a long time. The girls fell silent. Leave me, Esther said. They filed out of her room. Have we offended her? Anexi asked when they were outside. We didn't say anything about her or her people, just about Rispa. Aisha looked at them sharply. She wants to hear your stories, but she doesn't want to listen to you girls fight. Still, Aisha shook her head. Although she greatly admired her mistress, there were times when the new wife seemed such a mystery. She really didn't understand her. On impulse, Aisha followed Rispa out to one of the ornamental pools in the gardens. Are you okay? She asked the Judahite girl. The reason it hurt my feelings, Rispa said in a shaky voice, was probably because it's true. My people did receive permission to go back and rebuild the temple, but my family was doing well where they were in Babylon, so they chose not to go. Then there were problems and fighting broke out and, well, I ended up here. Maybe the God of Judah can't bless me when my family didn't go back to Jerusalem as he had arranged for us. And I'm almost sure he can't bless me here in a Persian harem. Aisha's eyes softened. Oh, Rispa, your parents may not have made the choices your God wanted them to, but none of this has been your fault or choice. The things you have told us other times sounded as if your God treats each person as an individual. Would he punish you for the decisions of your parents? I don't know. Sometimes I'm not sure of anything anymore. I used to be, but now I think maybe he's forgotten those of us who didn't go back. and He's just going to bless the ones who are there. I don't know your God, Aisha said, but I hope it's not that way. Please try not to be sad and try not to do anything that will upset our mistress. The twelve months of preparation has ended and she should be going to the king any day now. We don't want anything to upset her. What happens when she spends the night with him will affect the whole rest of her life and ours. Rispa wiped at her eyes. I know that it will and I wish I could ask my god for help. Well, please do. We should all pray to our gods. Do you think my god would listen to me here in exile when we Jews aren't supposed to be in exile anymore? Please uh, ask him, Aisha suggested. If he helps us with this, perhaps I'll even worship him. The Judahite girl smiled. I will, she promised. This broadcast has come from the book Exile of the Chosen by Sally Pearson Dillon with permission from the Review and Herald Publishing Association. This book and the rest of the series, War of the Ages, can be purchased by going to www.adventistbookcenter.com or by calling 1-800-765-6955. I'm your narrator, Austin Backus, and this audio project is a gift to you from my free Christian book ministry, RXF 1888. Please visit our website, www.rxf1888.com, to request free Christian books for both kids and adults. And join us here again for more stories from Mark the Recording Angel.